Here's your primetime president and co-founder, Al and Tommy Cooper. Well, Thanks. praise God, Tommy and I welcome you to this program, which I believe people are going to find very, very interesting. Oh, it is. I, and, you probably would like to set your recorder. Uh, even if you will be around to watch it, you want to set your recorder. Uh, we have the privilege of having Jim and Penny Caldwell, Split Rock Research Foundation, Diamond Head, Mississippi. And uh, they have the most incredibly fantastic story. Uh, and I'm not going to steal any of your thunder, guys. But thank you for sending me your book. I can't wait to hear about it in person. And uh, you have been on an incredible journey for several years. She wouldn't even let me talk to her while she was reading it. <laughs> so where, where shall we start? Tell us about yourselves first. Okay. Well, we are oh so happy to be here. We thank you so much for having us. It is a real blessing to be able to come and sit down and talk with you. Um, we have come up all the way from deep south Mississippi here <laughs> to Texas, and um, but we're bringing a story to you from all the way on the Arabian Peninsula yes. because there are some amazing things that are being uncovered there in our day and time, and we are only so blessed to have able to, been able to be a part of that. Um, Jim and I lived in uh, Saudi Arabia for 12 years. He took a job there in January of 19... Well, actually, in actually. September of 87. Mm -hmm. And um, he announced to us that he would be moving our two children, which were then three years old and five years old, and myself to Saudi Arabia. And I promptly asked him, with what wife were you planning to go? Because I'm not going to go. <laughs> she so. went, but she went kicking and screaming. Yeah, I mean, it was yeah. literally clawing the, uh, the asphalt until we got on the plane. And then she couldn't get the door open to get back out once we were taken off. Right, so we did right. So he to, did manage to get me over there. We did manage to get her there, yeah. But um, at any rate, uh, we have so much to be able to share. I'm going to try to just tell you very quickly how we wound up looking for this wonderful mountain okay. on the other side of Saudi yes. Arabia. And that would be a mountain called Jebel Al Laws. Um, and Jebel Makla in Arabic, and um, we were uh, just, I, I, tr I wanted to say happily working in, over there in Saudi Arabia, but I wasn't really happy about being there <laughs> at the beginning, to be sure. But after the Gulf War, the children and I were actually sent out, as were most of the families, during the time of the Gulf War. We lived right on the Persian Gulf. Um, the Scud missiles were actually flying over our home to get to Dahran, Saudi Arabia, wow. and from, you know, the, the first Gulf War. So it was very dangerous for the women and children to be there. To make a long story short, I didn't return to Saudi Arabia until July of 1991. And uh, it was a, a whole new world after the Gulf War had taken place. And uh, it was very difficult for us in a lot of different ways to readjust to living there. But Jim was working a night shift out at, this is, at the time, was the largest. Why was it hard to readjust? Well, everything had changed a great deal after the Gulf War. 600,000 U.S. soldiers were on Saudi Arabian territory, and there was a great controversy about that because uh, Saudi Arabia is considered the holiest Islamic country of all because they contain the cities and the shrines at Mecca and Medina which are the holiest of all to the Muslims. And the idea that that many Christians or other religions... Pagans. Pa yeah, what they <laughs> would consider to infidels. be infidels, infidels were mm -hmm. on their soil. Mm -hmm. The whole dynamic of the region changed very dramatically in how they perceived us being there. So as we... As we um, we're trying to readjust, and I, we were almost apart for a year because of what had happened there. And for us to fly back into that and try to get readjusted to the life we had there, mm -hmm. which is a very different life living on a, an American compound, sure. um, it was very difficult. In fact, we were at each other's throats quite a bit. <laughs> and it's a miracle that we are still sitting here together with you, I would add. Yeah. But um, God had a plan that, we, that was so fantastic and so amazingly... Um, we could have never dreamed 
of something as big as what we wound up being dropped right down into the middle of. Uh -huh. Jim worked a night shift out at the refinery, which was the largest in the world at that time, right there on near the Straits of Hormuz in the Persian Gulf on the east side of Arabia. And he went into uh, work one evening, and I went to pick him up at 11 p.m. because he was working a 3 to 11 shift. And when I saw him walking out toward me, toward the vehicle, this is the early part of December of 1991, it was as though his hair was blown back. He was white as a ghost, and I thought, oh, my gosh, something awful has happened. But when he got in the truck, he could barely even speak to me. And by the time we got back to our house, which was only a five-minute drive, I mean, you know you're right there on the compound, he began to tell me in very broken language just what he had seen. And he had had an, uh, just an enormous vision. Wow. And this was a man who wasn't so sure that visions existed. Uh -huh. I, I was very skeptical of visions, of people that had visions and then, then tried to... It may be a vision concerning your life or one thing or another about your, you know, what, what you're doing. And so visions were, you know, distant to me. I had never had a vision. Uh, I went into work that evening to make a long story. It's very well detailed in her book, by the way, this whole story. But I had a vision that the Ark of the Covenant was being carried through the desert back to the place that it was built. And that I was to go there and that we were going to find the Ark in a cave. And then the vision, vision stopped. So when she met me, I, I, this is just poor. I'm pouring over this in my mind. To be honest with you, I didn't even know where the Ark of the Covenant was built. That was my lack of knowledge of the Old Testament. And I'm telling her this vision and the other things that went along with it. And I'm saying, we've got to go to Mount Sinai. We have, we've just got to go. And she's, yeah. she's just saying, what are you talking about? I, I don't understand. What are you talking about? I said, no, this is so real. It's giving me mm -hmm. chills down. Just, yeah. It was so real to me that we have to go there. And so for the next three weeks, this was in December the 4th, as a matter of fact, of 1991. For the next three weeks, we planned on going, driving our vehicle across Saudi Arabia, 24-hour drive, entering into uh, Jordan crossing the ferry onto the Sinai Peninsula and going to the tr to Mount Sinai, which is where we thought it was, of mm -hmm. course. And of course, in the Bible, it talks about the Ark of the Covenant and its construction. And of course, it is at the base of Mount Sinai. So this is what propelled us to go to make this driving trip across Arabia by ourselves. I broke all of the cardinal rules of traveling in the desert alone. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't care. I, I, I said, we are going. This is so powerful in me. The drive was so strong that we could not go. Mm -hmm. So this is what we did. You know, and initially we did not have a clue that there was a controversy over the location of the real Mount Sinai. I mean, after all, um, you know, in fact, I'd known people who had gone and, and made a pilgrimage to the, the traditional site in the Sinai Peninsula of Egypt, uh, St. Catherine's, Jebel Musa. Um, and so we just plotted our course to go exactly straight there. Mm -hmm. um, but in that little interim time, that three-week period of time, um, I'll, I'll just have to explain this to you. Over there in Arabia... Customs dictates everything. When you go in, even if you are a Christian or any other religion other than being a Muslim, they don't allow you to have any kind of uh, jewelry or uh, a Bible or anything like that. Now, there's plenty of them there because people smuggle them in all the time. But um, it's very, very difficult to maintain any kind of... Um, practice of what you believe unless you do it behind closed doors mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um, everything's underground right as far as the church goes we managed to get hold of a, a vhs copy of the movie the ten commandments that somebody had smuggled in uh, you know uh -huh. charlton heston uh -huh. the whole thing and so for three weeks my children are now seven years old and nine years old for three weeks we solidly watched that movie day in and day out. Now, I know that it's not um, exactly mm -hmm. what the scripture mm -hmm. says, but, you know, for a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old, we wanted them to have some kind of concept of why this is so important mm -hmm. and why are we blasting mm -hmm. off to drive to Egypt mm -hmm. to go to this place. And, and, you know, we taught them about the Ark of the Covenant and everything. And, but Jim was devouring Exodus. 
and so I was actually, I. I had actually tore the Exodus out of my Bible. I had an Amplified and then taped it up so I could fold it up and put it in my pocket uh -huh. and get into the refinery in the evening. Because if you were caught with something like that, you're out of the kingdom. That's it. So, so uh, we would be, uh, you know, I would get into work, and I worked in the evening shift alone. And so when, as soon as I made my round, I would be sitting there, and then I would pour through and just reread and read and see what the geography of this place was going to be like. Get a mental impression of what we were to see when we would go. I really didn't know what the traditional site mm -hmm. looked like, mm -hmm. but what we should see through the eyes of the people that were there. And then, like she said, in conjunction with getting home and with the children, watching the, uh, this, this movie, the Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments. I mean, it, was, it built an image in our hearts mm -hmm. and minds that we were going to find mm -hmm. when we got to the traditional location. And lo and behold, um, as we started making this driving journey across Arabia, um, it was just us and our kids in the truck by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we took off from uh, Ras I mean, right on... We lived a block from the water of the Gulf, of the Persian Gulf. Wow. We took off from there. It's about 27 or so hours up to a town called Hockle, which is the border of Jordan. You cross on over into Aqaba, Jordan. At that time, the Israeli borders were not open. We could only get into Egypt on the Sinai by taking what they called the Arab Bridge or this huge big ferry, um, the kind that holds a thousand people and you can drive semi trucks and cars mm. and trailers onto. So that's what we did. Um, but, and that's how we wound up on the Egyptian Sinai, headed for Mount Sinai. But what started happening to us as we went along was nothing short of, I, I don't know any other way to tell you, but supernatural events began to happen to us. Um, one of the most profound, and you'll see in a little while, we have some film and we have some photographs to show you in your viewing audience Good. that um, are very startling. And one of those things was uh, it actually began to snow on us in a place in Saudi Arabia. Now, granted, it was January, but we were not up in the high mountains. And this We're event, that's right. It never snows in mid Arabia. Once well, every 70 75 years. years or so, yeah, that, that you might see a snowfall there. Mm -hmm. And it began to snow on us. And we videoed it. Jim was videoing it to prove to people this is not sleet or mm -hmm. hail. This is actually snow. Mm -hmm. What we didn't realize until he was zooming in with the camera is these little snowflakes that were falling were all, all looked exactly alike. Unusual. That's not really supposed to happen. No. I mean, we learn very young in science that all snowflakes mm -hmm. are different. But then it dawned on us, oh, my gosh, what are we looking at? Because every single one of them, it was like, if you're a mom, you'll know what I'm talking about. You roll out cookie dough, and you take a little heart-shaped cutter, and you cut out a bunch of little hearts. Mm -hmm. Well, these just happened to be a bunch of little six-pointed stars of David. They were all identical. And, you know, no, but you don't have to believe me, but I've got film to prove it. Uh -huh. And I hope we'll be able to, to oh, get into so that too. and show it, we show don't it have later. It with us, unfortunately. Oh, oh you it, don't? You have to go to our website. Okay. okay. Of, Actually, it is. It, it is, is a live website. video uh, yeah. you can check on you our website. You can screaming in the background yep. and, and see the video of it, not <laughs> so, uh -huh. freeze frame on the snowflakes. But things like that began to happen to us as we were headed toward Egypt. And, and we were noting them as, wonder what in the world is going on here. But this continued throughout our whole trip. To make a very long story short, uh, in fact, I'll just tell you, the, the book, uh, I call the book The God of the Mountain, because um, there's been a lot of talk about this as a potential, this Jebel Laws being the real mountain. Mm -hmm. But the story that hasn't been told is the fact that it, it's not really, it is about archaeology to us, because that's your initial doorway mm -hmm. into understanding that something might have been historically wrong right. for a number of years. But it's really more to us personally about the leading of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who carried us into Egypt and out again, which is such a parallel to what he did to the children of Israel. 
into Egypt and out again. And we began to see these parallels as we went. So what I wrote in the book was every little detail that happened to us. And there were so many of those little supernatural events that, you know, I've got almost a 500-page book, and it's only the first three trips we made <laughs> to the region. So at any rate, we ended up making 15. But what ended up happening, we got to this traditional site and because it was so fresh in our minds, what the book of Exodus records ought to be there, or at least uh, the lay of the land that ought to be able to contain the tents of a million plus people. Mm -hmm. Something was grossly disappointing as we pulled up through the Wadi systems and pulled up to the traditional site. It was, the first thing I remember being astounded by is, that mountain doesn't look high at all. How could they lose Moses up there? If he's at the top of that mountain, everybody in the valley could see him. Mm -hmm. I could see the top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. And so we became very disappointed. Jim and I looked at each other and went, hmm. Something's wrong. Maybe that was not a real vision. Maybe we're just all wet and we built mm -hmm. this all up in our minds mm -hmm. and, you know, we're a wild goose chase. It's a wild goose chase, and we just really wanted a big adventure, so yeah. maybe we made it all up. Maybe it wasn't as much as you thought. Well, for about the next three weeks, we had that, that much time off, and we actually did the whole rest of Egypt. We drove our truck from Cairo all the way down to the border of Sudan wow. and back up again. But one of the things that happened to us when we were very uh, in the very beginning entering into the Sinai Peninsula, they compounded our truck and threw it in customs for two days, and they would not release our truck. <laughs> we didn't have the proper paperwork to get our vehicle into Egypt. So immediately they... You know they, you had gone through Egypt to get there. Yes. Well, well, well it was a, the initial... It, it was, she, it was she the initial... It was the initial trip going across the ferry. When we got to customs, our vehicle was, was taken and impounded. Yeah, it was impounded. Okay. So we had a... We were not planning to exit the country by the same way we had come in. We were actually going to drive up to Alexandria and go across into Israel from that way because you could get in from Egypt to Israel at that time. You could not get in from Jordan to Israel except by way of Egypt. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, because that was back in 1991, 1992, and they had not yet opened up the Allenby Bridge and, and the various other entrances from Jordan. So um, we were forced by virtue of that little detail which we now know was a, a complete arrangement sure. from on high, uh -huh. uh, to leave the country by the same way we came in. And so we were on our way back up, uh, back onto the Sinai after having driven all the way down to Sudan. We were at the tip of the Sinai Peninsula in a place called Sharm el-Sheikh. And we were at a hotel there just waiting our time because of the nature of the Saudi Arabian laws. We had to stay out of the country a certain amount of days before he as an employee was allowed back in the country. So we had about a week left. And uh, we were just sitting at the tip of the Sinai. The, there's a, a, a beautiful underwater reef there called Ras Muhammad and we're avid divers and you know we were just okay we've given up the the spiritual journey of this because we must have just been all wet about this Sinai and the ark and all of this so we were trying not to be too disappointed and just enjoying what mm -hmm. had to offer the hotel had a little gift gift shop and um, it was very um, it wasn't a bookstore there was one little bookshelf and in that bookshelf I saw something caught my eye the Gold Mines of Midian. Now, this was a reprint of a book that was written by Sir Richard Burton in the 1800s. And he was a, an explorer of vast portions of what is now Saudi Arabia, but it was the Ottoman Empire at the time. Make a long story short, in the back of this book written in the 1800s, he had hand penned a map of, of northwest Saudi Arabia, and he had the land of Midian on the east side of the Gulf of Aqaba, squarely in northwest Saudi Arabia. And when Jim and I looked at that, we went, oh my goodness, if Midian in the 1800s was known not to be in the Sinai, but to in fact be in northwest Saudi Arabia, we're looking in the wrong place for the mountain. And Mountain's got to be in Midian. That, that was a relief as well as a disappointment, I it guess. Was, no, huh? it, was a, it was overwhelming excitement. Uh -huh. I mean, we all of a sudden yeah. re-energized the possibility that okay. we may still be on to something that uh -huh. just could be real. And and the very next day we went back in there, a book that wasn't there the previous day, 
uh, appeared, and it was a great big volume. We could have, couldn't have missed it, but it was called the God. Of the, it was called the Mountain of God, and it was by Emmanuel Anadi, an archaeologist that was working in the southern Negev on a place called Har Karkum. And in the very first few sections of the book, he points out that the traditional location is in question, big question mark there, and that one of the possibilities was in Arabia called Jebel al-Laws. That was a clue. And then he had a couple pages later an identical kit for what you should find if you found the right mountain. And the traditional site fits none of the criteria. That's right. And he didn't say anything about Jebel al-Laws, but we knew through her connection, the land of Midian, Moses was in Midian. He had the encounter with the burning bush in Midian. Mm -hmm. Let's go. So for the next few days, we poured through these two books and then formulated our trip back into Arabia. We would cross back over the ferry, and then we would get down into this region and look for the highest mountain that we could find mm -hmm. and see what might be there. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And, and it was, I remember just being wild about, oh, can we leave today? Can we leave today? We've got to get back <laughs> into Saudi Arabia. Uh -huh. We've just uh -huh. got to be able to get back into Saudi Arabia. So that's really... Um, the details of that journey and what happened to us day by day is what the book is about. Mm -hmm. But what we saw when we got there was absolutely mind-boggling. And, and, you know, that, that term just doesn't fit truly. Mm -hmm. um, it, I don't know how to describe this to you. When we first stood at the base of this mountain... That, that's called Jebel Laws, or specifically uh, Jebel Machlin. Again, we'll, we'll show you the differences here in the next few minutes. Um, all I can remember is, uh, you know, I have a big, sturdy fellow right here. Mm -hmm. And we stood at the base of that mountain, and his knees buckled out from under him. And the next thing I knew, he was on the ground. And as soon as I saw him on the ground, my knees gave out from under me, and I was on the ground. And it was as though... It, so everything that was on the inside of us said, you're home, mm. you're here, yeah. you right have found it, yeah. uh, not because of previous lifetimes or reincarnation right. or anything no. No. Something in your goofy spirit. like so that, this is but something, there was connected. a witness there, call it a residual glory, I don't mm. know, I, I don't know how to explain it, but we knew that we knew that we knew but the presence of the Holy Spirit was so strong, you yes. couldn't stay on your feet. Yes. And the very next thing that enveloped us and just shook us to the core was, bring this to my people, Israel. Wow. Say it again. Bring this to my people, Israel. Wow. Mm. And, and think of it. If this is the real Mount Sinai, to oh, yes. whom would it be the most important? Mm -hmm. To Israel. It's not, well, the other one down south that they think is it, some of them, that's important to them. Even though they have all the discrepancies, and I've yes. talked to rabbis about it, and they mm -hmm. said, oh, you're all wet. It's, it's not down there. But you're, you're exactly right. It's really amazing. Um, after being there the first time, um, the we were we had these moments for about the scope of 45 minutes to an hour, and then the frontier forces, police forces, were on us. Now this is a these are a um, a police force that live in the desert. They are of the government of Saudi Arabia, but they are not like dispatched from a headquarters or something. They keep their headquarters in the desert, and it wasn't very long before they knew that there were faces there that were not local. Mm -hmm. And um, Was there other people there? Um, we had only, only the seen local the, the local yeah. uh, nomadic peoples, chance. the Bedouin. They, they live all in the region, depending on what time of the year is. They're mm -hmm. either closer up in the mountains or they're closer to the sea. Mm -hmm. And those people have always been, uh, you know, very friendly to us. We had traveled extensively throughout Arabia before we ever made this wonderful oh, trip to Egypt <laughs> that started all of this. But they'd always been very friendly to us and everything. Mm -hmm. And to have these forces roar up and pull out AK forty sevens and say, get out in no uncertain terms. Were you behind a fence or anything? Yeah, well 
No, not at the moment not that they the pulled up. Not at the time they came we up. We had been escorted into the area by a Bedouin's young boy, a 10-year-old, had opened the gate, taken us into the guard shack, which was vacated at the time, brought us around to where the pillars were, where the, what we call this covenant site, and that's where both of us fell to our knees. And that, that was that experience. But after a while, he had gone ahead, he came back to us, and then we walked back around. It's a pretty good walk, it takes about 15 minutes, back around to our truck. By the time we walked up to the truck, here comes the frontier forces. Yeah. And they jump out, and, and I cannot express how uh, they tried to instill fear in us and t- intimidate us and insist that we leave. And I'm surprised that something worse didn't happen, mm-hmm. but it didn't. And we were able to leave. But just the point is, is that that was our very first experience at this mountain. We've been back 15 times. Wow. In fact, three weeks later. That's how important it is. The other thing that overwhelmed us after we got that kind of a reaction was, who do they think they are? Yes. And why are you not allowed? Yes. I, I think what welled up inside of us was like, Wait a minute. Not only do we have a perfect right to be here, this belongs to our people. Uh huh. And uh, livid. We were <laughs> livid. It was like, yes, how livid. dare you tell us we cannot be here? Uh-huh. But of course, you know, at, at the other end of the of gun, weapon, yeah. you're not going to argue too right. much. We, just, we kept this internalized. Can I rewind the tape? What You mentioned pillars. You lost me there. Right, Moses erected 12 pillars, each one of them representing one of the tribes of Israel. At that place? At this place. And they're exactly. still standing? And they're still there. That's what well, we're going to show nine you. Of them. Nine of them are still yeah. there. But, and the so, ground has been uh, through earthquakes and other things, and it's kind of scattered around. But you can still see with, you know, with not much imagination that these, this was set up, there was a platform built, pillars were erected. It's an amazing site, yes. And still there, 3,500. That's why I think that this site and this place... For the tabernacle? The, the, that, the foundation yes. of the tabernacle, we believe we really, believe right we have there. located where it yes. was sitting. You know, it's the most significant biblical find in the modern era. Mm-hmm. It, and, and nobody knows about it. And what we're here about is and we're, we're going to... And by not a scholar and, and TV evangelist or anything, just... Plain. Jim and Penn. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I want to. I, I see we've yeah. got. Uh, we're going to run out of time, and okay, I have so a lot of exciting things I'd like to share please. with you. Yeah. So we'd like to roll. What I, there's two minute segments. There's a lot of information. People describe it, and I, and I heard uh, someone else say that you know it's like being hit with a fire hose of information. <laughs> there will sure. be a lot of information. Of course, we're not going to be able to get to all of it. But uh, I would like to show the first roll-in, which is Sinai and Horeb, and it's going to give you an overview of the whole place. Mm-hmm. All right. That's Damn. ready to roll. Let's see it. Horeb in northwest Saudi Arabia, we found ourselves gazing in awe toward the south at the majestic beauty of Mount Sinai. Blackened and different from all its surrounding companions, this mountain stands apart at first glance. As we began our climb up the northern flank of this unique mountain, the dividing line between light and dark granite became glaringly obvious. Exodus 24:17 records that the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of this mountain. And now, sitting on Sinai's very peak, the color of these rocks can truly be seen. Coming into view now is the granite peak called the Brown Laws by ancient maps. After extensive research, we believe that Horeb and Sinai are two distinct mountains, and that is why they're referred to that way in Scripture. But for now, we'll go back to our view from the top of Sinai, and as you can see here, the valley floor below is enormous and well able to contain the huge numbers comprising those who came out of Egypt. About halfway up the eastern face of Sinai is this hidden valley that can't be seen from below. Exodus 24, 9 and 10 tells us of a meeting of the Lord with Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 elders of Israel. They saw God at a distance and as it were a pavement of sapphire under his feet. And glancing upward to where the glassy blackness appears, it's not difficult to imagine a deep blue shine here from the glory of the Lord. Looking all the way down into the camp, we get our first glimpse of the altar to the golden calf. Fenced and forbidden by the Saudis to enter, we would have to devise a plan to get close-up footage of this on another trip. 
In the same manner, close in to the base of Sinai, we saw the clear image of a double wall corral leading up to a slaughter area and an altar of earth and uncut stone. Just behind the altar is a dry stream bed running from the mountain all the way into the valley below. Moses cast the remnants of the golden calf into the brook that came out of the mount, according to Deuteronomy 9.21. Here you can see the fence that the Saudis have erected to keep people out of this area. It is extensive and encloses a guard outpost visible here. They are quite serious about keeping the eyes of the world off this mountain. Wow. That is a lot of information. <laughs> and, and that's three minutes of six of the roll-ins that we've brought. Uh-huh. But it is a tremendous amount of information. And, and to watch that, just you know, it brings it back so vividly in my mind. It gives me chills to see uh, just how this is preserved. And we're going to get in further into each one of the um, areas that we talked about, the golden calf altar a place where Moses built the altar where he sacrificed oxen, the pillars that he erected, each one representing one of the 12. So we're going to see that as well. Um, It became very apparent to us that they had no intention of allowing this information to leave that country. So it became very clear to us that our mandate then must be getting a film record of what is there. Um, Film and uh, still photography and anything we could just in case they ever decided to eradicate it. Mm -hmm. I would hope and pray that they would never do such a thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the geopolitical climate we live in right now where all the earth seems to want to wipe Israel off Mm -hmm. the map, um, I'm not well convinced that they would not try to rid themselves of any sort of right. Israeli history. Mm-hmm. Well, they did it on so, the Temple Mount. Why not? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And now they claim the temple didn't even exist. Mm-hmm. So uh, Let's bring up photos 2 yeah. through 10, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of just step through these maybe a couple seconds each. Okay. And uh, that is our original slide. There we go. Well, That's- there we go. This is the mountain that we do believe is the real Mount Sinai. We're looking from the north to the south. It's actually called Jebel Makla, and you can see it's a very different color from all the surrounding mountains. Mm-hmm. Um, there's argument as to whether or not it's charred black or whether that's just natural basalt, but um, to us there's so many other region, uh, reasons why this mountain is the real Mount Sinai. It's almost a moot point to us. <laughs> But if you go ahead and bring up the next one, this, we believe, is Mount Horeb. Uh, This is properly called Jebel Laws. It's about, from peak to peak, what, about five miles? About five miles across. Um, The area is enormous. Uh, This Jebel Laws, uh, we believe sincerely, is Mount Horeb uh, for a lot of different reasons, but one of which is there is something in the Bible called the uh, Rock of Horeb. You never hear it spoken of as the Rock at Sinai. And if you make Sinai and Horeb the same mountain, then you've got a problem with where you locate the rock that Moses struck that the waters came from, which we'll be able to show you, uh, we believe, pretty clearly here just shortly. Next slide. But uh, these two mountains, it's interesting. That, that is Jim right there that you see. Uh, September 24th of 1992, we finally made it to the top of what we believe to be Sinai. And you can see the distance now uh, where the arrow's pointing. We believe that is Horeb, and that split no rock is on the other side. No problem with the guards the going up side. there? Oh, yeah, there were problems. There. We managed to figure out other ways to get up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we didn't there go from the front. We would drive around to the back. Jump or out of the jump out of the truck with hide backpacks truck. on, hide the, hide the truck, the truck and run as fast as we could to get away from the truck and disappear up into the mountains. Mm-hmm. And we spent we five days to... camping in the mountains, so we would be away from the vehicle quickly, and that would give us a chance to get up and uh, you know and to hide ourselves. Um, and it just happens to be on that you saw September twenty fourth, nineteen ninety two. That was my thirty eighth birthday, so I was blessed. Wow. By God, to be able to spend my birthday waking up on the top of Mount Sinai, which was an incredible experience. Go ahead and bring up the next slide. This is uh, actually from the top of that mountain that you saw across the valley, which we call Horeb. We managed to climb to the top of it. If you notice the date, and this was happens chance, these are the type of God things that happened to us. That is September 24th of 94. 
That happened to be my 40th birthday. <laughs> so we were able to spend my 40th birthday on top of the uh, other peak, which is what we call yeah. Mount Horeb. And you can see real clearly right there um, how very different that the black whole that whole mountain is very different from all the surrounding mountains and you know like i said whether it's charred black or whether it's natural rock it's irrelevant almost to me because the fact that god would choose a different place to come down on and this mountain mm. absolutely stands apart from any of the others in the region next slide and this was uh this was a, the uh, 1992 trip when we made it to the top to the left of the screen in the center, you can't see it that well, but that is the Gulf of Aqaba. So your vantage oh, wow. point in your view from that location is, and it's one of the reasons why I was trying to get to the top, because we could not figure out the lay of the land. It was so mm -hmm. convoluted uh -huh. and so huge uh -huh. that to get, a, get a, a perspective of where we were and where all these things fit together, that's one of the reasons why we made it to the top. The next slide. Now, this is something, uh, particularly for any of your viewers who may have seen pictures of this mountain, or because I'm telling you, it's all over the web. It's, it's, it is. There's, there's many, many, many websites and uh, various films and stuff that's been made thus far about this. But there's a confusion. When you're standing in the valley below and you're looking up, we've got it circled in red. Everyone thinks that, in that circle, is the top of the mountain. And in reality, it's nowhere near the top of the mountain. Really? These, these uh, areas Excellent. are so large... Yeah, go ahead. If that same circle, we are now up on the top looking down. And that circle that you see is the same black peak you just saw from the other side. Really? So it's really the first peak uh -huh. that you see from the valley. But, but the valley, the angles are so steep, you cannot see the real peak uh -huh. from the valley. Uh -huh. So we really wanted to open this up to everyone to show them that little thing where it says campsite, there's a tiny little blue dot in the middle uh -huh. of that little circle, and that's our tent. <laughs> so we, were, we still kept climbing. That black Next peak slide. you see uh, the, the first peak you see from the valley the floor left. is on the left. That little blue tent is where that middle arrow is, and the real top of the mountain is right up there. Oh, my God. So, uh, a mile and a half yeah. from the valley. It, it's enormous. And, again, Moses could have been up there uh -huh. for 40 days and been missing yep. uh, because there's no way that you would see yeah. him you know, mm -hmm. yeah. at, at the mm -hmm. top of the mountain. Yep. And then the next slide. And then this gives you a perspective of what we're talking about, the location. You see Mount Horeb to the, to the north of and Mount Sinai to the south of. And uh, just to put them on a geographical map and, and their relationship to each other. A little skewed north and south. Mount Horeb is, looks like granite. Is yes, it, granite? it is. It is. It's a, it's a but Mount Sinai doesn't look like the same uh, it's actually a bluish stone uh -huh. that is a basalt. Uh, some of the archaeologists, some of the geologists called it uh, original earth. That's what they call that was their name for it. And it has a blackened patina, which is uh, desert varnish, they call it uh -huh. on it. But from the crater area, we talked about it in the roll-in, and you're, if you're in that place where we believe the 70 elders went, mm -hmm. where they could see God at a distance, mm -hmm. that stone has cast a blue hue that is very, very mm -hmm. much like the sky. And it talks about the sapphire pavement yes. under the feet of God yes. as being uh, blue or sapphire as if it were as clear as the heavens. And you can see that it blends right into the blueness of the sky. Just another, wow. yeah. just another yeah. little thing uh -huh. about this place that is so incredibly uh, significant. Do we want to? Yeah, let's go ahead. If you'll pull the next one up, this this was brought to our attention by Dr. Glenn Fritz. He's a very dear friend. Um, he is a, a geographer, um, Ph.D. He has a magnificent work he has just released called "The Lost Sea of the Exodus," and it's a geogra uh, geographical analysis. And, of course, he did most of his research on where the crossing site would have been. But he brought this to our attention uh, a number of years ago, 
And this is really profound, the insight he had about this particular thing. We were listening to a teaching on this last night, but this is from his, uh, as a geographer, he went back to the Greek and he studied this and he called us up one day and he was really excited. He said, guys, you will not believe what this says. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, Galatians 4.25 and 26. He says, where it says this Mount Sinai is in Arabia, that's pretty self-evident, right? I mean, that, that's Paul yeah. speaking. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. in, in Arabia. God made the difference that, between Arabia and Egypt. Yeah, <laughs> a, a lot bit. of difference, you would think. And then he, and it says, to, and answereth to Jerusalem. He said that term is used once in the Bible, and it's a geog- geography. It's a term that's used only in geography, where you're describing to march in a straight line. And he said the other term that's a once use in the Bible is above. And he said that means to the north of. So literally you could say that Jerusalem is north of Mount Sinai in a straight line due south. Oh. So the next slide brings us to that line coming down from Jerusalem due south on the same line of longitude passes right between this Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai. Isn't that amazing? Oh, that is amazing. Isn't that? I mean, we we saw that and just danced about for quite a while. How because literal the scripture is. Exactly. In, in its yes. Exactly. Uh-huh. So again, you have to be at the right location to be able to determine these things. If you were looking for that uh, that connection at the traditional site, it doesn't work mm-hmm. because right. it's to the southwest mm-hmm. of Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't make any sense. So again, you know, uh, as we see these things unfold. It's amazing. Do we want to go to the uh, altar? Yeah, pillars? let's let's go ahead. We're we're doing well the, here. This will be the. Oh, oh, you're talking about the the video? Yeah. Well, just just a quick on the photo that's up. We're seeing Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai, and then there's another box to the right at the bottom. It says Altar Corral Pillars in Elijah's Cave, just to let you know that it's located on the east side of the of Mount Sinai and where it is in. in uh, re- relationship to the rest of it. So go ahead and roll the roll in altar pillars. Next to it, it's a slaughter platform and the altar. The stream bed can be seen running behind and around the corral, as well as the white pillars out in front. From well inside the forbidden fence, I soon discovered the Saudis had completed a partial excavation of this site in 1996. You can plainly see the outlines of the slaughter platform and the corral directly behind it. Next to that is a pit, complete with layer upon layer of ash and the access area to the sacrificial altar. In Exodus 24, 5, young men sacrificed many oxen as peace offerings to the Lord there at Sinai. This large corral would have been necessary to lead them up to the slaughter platform. There they would have been sacrificed and the blood captured in basins, and Moses would have placed the offerings into the fire directly behind him. The altar itself was just beyond the fire, and there he sprinkled the blood. Just in front of the corral and the altars are the remains of white pillars and their foundation stones. We have found them to be made of a crude and discovered the source of this stone near the crossing site of the Red Sea. Moses built an altar and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel as recorded in Exodus 24:4. These pillars are each of differing sizes, possibly according to the number of each tribe of Israel that they represented. As you can see, they are very, very well preserved. Looking back upward from the altar area, a large cave is visible from below. First Kings 19, 8 and 9 tell us that Elijah came to Horeb, mountain of God, and then found a cave to lodge in. This is yet another bit of evidence needed to identify Mount Sinai found here at Jebel Laws. I was only able to get inside this cave once, but it was well worth this spectacular view of the valley below. Um, You can tell even just by looking out of that cave how vast 
that mm. area is out in front of mm -hmm. that mountain. I'm tell you could have put 10 million people in that valley mm -hmm. out there. There's well enough room to have uh, had to have been able to the encampment. put the people mm -hmm. there that mm -hmm. the scripture says mm -hmm. came up out of Egypt when the mixed multitude and everything. Mm -hmm. There's plenty enough room there for it. But um, this is astonishing to us that, that these pillars are there, that this formation is there. One of the things that was amazing to us, um, in the beginning, uh, it's been said that perhaps these white marble pillars were uh, a shrine that Solomon built at some time later mm -hmm. to commemorate that this was where the real Mount Sinai was. Well, Jim and I never were of that opinion. And the more that Jim was able to get down into that area behind the fence, he's been back there quite a few times. And... Um, the more he was able to get down in there, a picture began, began to develop in his mind because, based upon a childhood experience he had had. What, what she's talking about is when I was uh, uh, in, in my teens, I would go to the farm, and, and it was always this thing with my grandfather that we were going to work. The kids don't want to work, but he's going to work. You, you come there, you're going to work, and then you eat. That's always the thing. So, uh, but we would work on the bullpen. And he had, this is, you know, 40, 50 years ago, and the bullpens were made out of wood, and there was always repairs to be made. But the thing that was significant is when we would run the bulls or the animal, the cattle, up into this thing, they would come up to what's called the squeeze. There was always an angle of where this mm -hmm. narrow corridor mm -hmm. took them to before they went up to the squeeze, where they do the branding and these other things. And animals typically will bolt especially if they're cutting this kind of thing when they, when they sense this. Mm -hmm. So that's why that angle is there. And when I was standing in this, in this area and looking out um, uh, back at this, this L-shaped, what people previously called the altar, I called it the corral because it so fit the idea of a bullpen mm -hmm. and a mechanism for them to be able to handle oxen and bring them mm -hmm. up to an altar for sacrifice. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was that was part of the thinking. Now, if you bring up yep. uh, slide Go, number well, 24. Yep. Oh, yeah, he's, he's got, yep. uh, this is a, a view from up above looking down at the corral. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and go through the next couple of slides. And the animal shoots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then there you go. You see the double-walled corral where they would have been bringing them up. Again, this is the sacrificial area. And it looked exactly like the bullpen from, you know, his, his childhood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So why would this be in the middle of the desert floor, in the middle of absolutely nowhere, at the base of this mountain that already has some of these other characteristics that we're starting to see fit the biblical description uh -huh. exactly. There's a stream, as you saw in the roll-in, yes. there's a stream bed that comes mm -hmm. out of this thing. There's um, these pillars and foundation blocks, which we can go ahead to. We've got the next several slides. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, and, yeah, that's again, we're mm -hmm. talking about the animal shoots. And then the next slide, um, just pointing out different elements of this whole thing, uh -huh. uh, the slaughter platform. Next right. slide. Uh, again, we see the altar, which would have been an earthen altar. And then again, the next one, which would be um, the ash pit. If you're looking, I always say, if you're looking for the ashes of the original sacrifice or the, the ashes of the red heifer, this would be the place. Mm -hmm. Wish I'd have brought a sample. Didn't mm -hmm. think about that part of it. So, <laughs> the, <laughs> and go then, ahead and uh, the next one. Number, yeah, go ahead and talk about this one. Okay. Uh, on, the, on the east side... Uh, we found this very large rock, and when I say very large, it's probably 20 feet across, maybe 20 feet high, very large rock. Um, and we find this interesting bunch of um, ancient graffiti on it here. Um, we've been told by various uh, archaeologists that have actually looked at this picture that all of these images were not etched onto this rock at the same time. This is progressive years of etching, if you will. But what stood out to us is that these uh, either oxen or bovine creatures, some of them are facing this way to the, to the left, and then there's others that are facing over to the right. And on a few of them, you see a, a man or a stick figure type behind them. And we were actually told by uh, someone who actually has large animals that you don't pull oxen are large cattle. 
The only way to get them to move is to get behind them and prod them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so Grab we, we wonder, right, mm-hmm. exactly. So we wonder, now granted, we are certainly not archaeologists, neither would I ever uh, propose to say that we are. But this is very interesting to us to have been found right in this vicinity where this, this V or L-shaped uh, stone formation is in the middle of the desert. And there's this etching of cattle going this way and then cattle going back this way. And we wonder, you know, does this, is this a picture of what was going on there? Mm-hmm. You know, only someone so, who's, uh, who knows could tell, but... And mm-hmm. this is my recreation, and a little go, a little crazy with uh, Photoshop. But uh, <laughs> what I was showing, what I'm showing here, is someone behind the cow or the oxen, pushing them ahead up to the slaughter platform. You see where Moses would have been, and then you see an arrangement of the twelve pillars out in the middle. Mm-hmm. I don't know how well that's uh, going to be able to be seen, but it's just an artist's rendition of what may have been yep. there. And the funny thing about it is, we have traveled extensively in the Middle East. I've been all over the places. Uh, in Jordan, all the ruins up up to the edge of Syria, Israel. I've never seen a mechanism that looks like this mm-hmm. anywhere. Mm-hmm. This is not a, a dwelling place of someone. It's a very unique and odd, um, odd formation. Mm-hmm. Go ahead and roll the next four photos. And here we're talking about these uh, pillars that are uh-huh. out in the front. Uh-huh. Uh, the next slide. And we see that there are six that I counted in this in this photo, and then to the next slide is seven and eight, and then I think there's one more that in situ this would have been like I found it in 1992. Now there has been an excavation in there. Some of these photos are from that era in, in 2003. Some of them have been moved since the original layout, but uh, but you can see that there are pillars on the ground. And then the next slide. Uh, this is the foundation stones, and they're a cubit by two cubit, you know, uh, about 18, 20 inches by 40 inches, 42 inches. And they would have laid a platform in there for them to set these pillars on. A lot of work, wow, a lot yes. of effort and energy went in, not mm-hmm. standing up some stones, but yeah, a, right. a yeah. memorial to what God was doing with them at this site. And then the next slide is where I, I take this, and each one of the pillars being a different height, and just using the, from numbers, the number of each tribe, smallest pillar being 12 inches, mm-hmm. and then extrapolating what the tallest pillar would be, and that would be the tribe of Judah. And it comes out to about 36 inches. And each one of these pillars fits into this yeah. linear graph almost perfectly, except there yeah. are three missing. Wow. You know, Scripture's pretty plain. It says, when Jacob set up a pillar... For Rachel's grave, it says Jacob set up a pillar. Mm -hmm. What the scripture says about Moses is Moses built an altar and 12 pillars. Mm -hmm. If it meant he stood a stone up, it would have said he stood a stone up as a pillar. It's very clear what it says with Jacob. Mm -hmm. But that's not what it says. It says he built an altar and 12 pillars. This was a betrothal and a ceremony at the base of Mount Sinai oh, wow. that wed Israel to the Lord God Almighty mm-hmm. oh, boy. What, what was supposed to be for all time. Yes. And very quickly that, that disintegrated into the golden calf incident, mm-hmm. which we have a very good candidate for shortly. But um, <laughs> All right, next photo, which would be 31. And this, uh, when we went in, back in 2003, we were able to make a climb up to the quarry where these marble pillars were taken from. And there are a couple that were marred that were not brought down the mountain, down into the valley. Mm. And this is an example of one of those. And then you can go ahead to the next slide. I found this to be just stunning. And this is the reason. You can see that there's a little bit of a white area up there that those two black arrows are pointing at. And this, to me, when I was looking at this picture and reading in the scripture, this specific scripture, look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the hole in the quarry from which you were dug. The previous scripture to that is, look unto your mother uh, Sarah and your father Abraham. Mm -hmm. This is the Lord God speaking out to Israel saying, look where you've come from. It's very clear to whom he's speaking. Mm -hmm. And here at this mountain, there is a quarry in the side of the mountain from which 12 marble pillars were pulled. 
one pillar for each of the tribes of Israel mm -hmm. that were brought down to the base of that mountain and the blood sprinkled on them. Mm. How much more perfect a picture ah. can you have of, and, of what uh, the Lord our God, how he feels about his law and how he feels about his people? Pull oh. from his very side, yes. the mountain of God. You Whoa. know, I mean, and, and to find this there on, on the ground and in the side of the mountain. There's so, like I said, there's so much more to this than archaeology. This really, that's only the opening door. Mm -hmm. What is the picture that's painted on the ground there that God wants us to see now, today? Right, right. This is what's so amazing to us. Let's go yeah. with the roll-in of the golden calf. going to run out of time. Across the valley floor from the base of Mount Sinai lie the remarkably preserved remains of the altar to the golden calf. Once again, I was miraculously able to slip inside the fence undetected and record the images of cattle literally covering these rocks. These petroglyphs, or rock carvings, represent distinctly Egyptian gods with Hathor be, being the female representation and Apis the male. These gods were actively worshipped in Egypt during the time that the Israelites were held captive there. The story is relayed to us in the 32nd chapter of Exodus, where the people grew restless waiting for Moses to return from the top of Mount Sinai. The people told Aaron, Up, make us gods to go before us. Aaron took their gold and fashioned for them a molten calf with a graving tool. What is intriguing about the story is that he fashioned a single idol, yet said, in sight of all of Israel, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. The scripture makes the same point later in the chapter when Aaron is explaining to what, what happened to Moses. He claims the people wanted gods to come before them. So he took their gold out, and out came a calf, once again singular. Looking at this site, however, the scripture becomes beautifully clear. Aaron prepared an altar to the idol, and then set the calf on the very top. The cattle you see here were carved right into the rocks upon which it sat. Standing back from the spectacle, one would have seen a golden calf sitting atop the rock carvings of Apis and Hathor, their former Egyptian gods. The calf, along with the images beneath it, would have been correctly spoken of as plural. These be thy gods, O Israel. It is noteworthy to mention that cattle have never been native to Saudi Arabia. These Egyptian gods carved in stone found here near the foot of the mountain surely give us yet another piece of evidence proving the certain truth of the word of God. There's quite an abundance of evidence. Not only now do we have the mountain sitting there that's got a cave on it, that's got a brook descending out of it. There's a very unique stone formation. There's pillars and foundation stones. And all of these things are spoken of directly in the scripture. Now, out in the valley where the people would have been, there's a fenced-off area with a bunch of cattle carved on the rock. Wow. Let's look at uh, 41. Again, we're just talking about these comparisons. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see a photo down in the left and the uh, next showing one. the style of horns. And then the next slide, uh, which is the apis. So and you can, it, you can again, see. The connection yes. to this just how Egyptian. similar they are. And then mm -hmm. the last slide just gives you uh, 43, gives you the grave area. Wow. And its, it's location out of the camp, um, the golden calf altar. And then, then all right, that's good. Oh, my goodness. Well, we're going to be in for a real thrill, Tommy, when we come back from this short break. And I know you won't want to tune out. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and uh, you'll probably be wanting to get a copy of the DVD as well as her book. And the book. And, and we, the book. We'll be yeah. telling you more about the book when we come back. And, oh, my goodness, and thank I've got you. a big question when we come back. Excellent. So Thank stay you for tuned. sharing this awesome story. If you enjoyed this program, GLC asks that you would help support us in the production of these programs. You can make your contribution through our website at www.glc.us.com, by phone, 
432-563-5200 or 1-866-846-5200 or by mail at P.O. Box 61000, Midland, Texas 79711-1000. We would like to extend our thanks for your prayers and support. Well, we're glad to be back with you. Now I understand why you were spending so much time with your nose in that book. That's right. The God of the Mountain, I was on the journey with Jim and Penny, and you can be too. You can take this same adventure. This book is just the beginning of God leading them and how he did it and the many miracles. It's just awesome. It is available in our bookstore and, of course, on their website. Well, let's oh, get back to them and see what's going on. Well, I want to tell you, if, if you are interested in having them come speak and share this, you could probably stay a weekend, right? Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. and Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We <laughs> love those take, type take, of events. Take that long if you want yeah. them. But uh, they are available, and that information is also on the website. So yes. let's yes. pick up where we left off, guys. Excellent. Okay. Well, one of the things uh, I was talking about was this Emmanuel Anadi, this archaeologist that had did the work for Israel in uh-huh. the southern Negev. He had this identikit that I talked about in his book, The Mountain of God. Yes. And, uh, and what we're starting to see is all of those pieces that he, as an archaeologist, said should be there but never found at any site that he has ever looked at or investigated are all starting to fall. Every one of these are falling into place. Mm-hmm. The next thing that we're going to show you is... Um, and this was one of the elements that has to be there, is a graveyard that could contain 3,000 that died at the Golden Calf. In one day. Right. And, and, ah, and exactly. there should be a graveyard there. So we're going to go ahead really? and Really? Well, I'm sorry? Yeah. Really? Yes. Yeah, I never thought Grave about yes. that. And tree, roll in. Let's look at this. Just east of Mount Horeb and well north of the base of Mount Sinai, a massive graveyard lies undisturbed behind another archaeological fence the Saudis have erected. In this never-before-released footage, you can clearly see the ancient headstones dispersed throughout the area. My dad and I secretly slipped inside this fence to obtain proof on film of this remarkable site. We know according to Exodus 32.28 that at least 3,000 men died after worshipping the golden calf, and by Levitical law, would have to be buried outside the main camp. Back to the valley, a small white building is surrounded by a rectangular fence. We believe this was built over the ruins of the original tabernacle. Oddly enough, in a high plain between Horeb and Sinai, another rectangular set of stone ruins has been left alone. Moses moved the tabernacle away from the main camp after the golden calf incident. Evidence of this is plainly found here. On their way up into this high pasture, Mom and Dad found another surprise waiting for them. Amazing because of its rarity, an enormous cedar appears out of nowhere, with two others that are actually attached by root systems to this one. As you can see from the sparse landscape with Mount Sinai in the background, there are no others on any of these mountains. Cedars do not grow in this area at all. Why was this one here? Upon closer inspection, the trunk of this cedar is more than 8 feet thick. Smaller olive trees in Israel have been found to be over 2,000 years old. Moses was tending the flocks of Jethro when he turned aside to see the burning bush, and God spoke to him directly. Could this be that very plant? My sister Chelsea and I were also with my parents when we located the almond trees. These are important to find on the mountain because Aaron's rod was made from an almond tree and budded and produced ripe almonds according to number 17.8. The bowls of the golden candlestick were also fashioned after the almond tree. Just as an interesting note, Horeb and Sinai are also covered with fig trees. Though a subject of much debate, the nation of Israel has many times been referred to as the fig tree in prophecy. They are to be found only on these two mountains. Finally, quail can be seen all over the area to this day. It is theorized that they fly in huge numbers over the sea from Egypt, only to fall to the ground exhausted on the Arabian side. Exodus 16.13 reads, And it came to pass at evening, the quails came up and covered the camp. So you can see there's quite a bit of evidence that's gaining 
uh, momentum here. We started out with that graveyard, and then we went into the other things. And, of course, quail are not archaeological remains. Neither right. are right. almond trees or fig trees. But, obviously, if you know your scripture, these things are highly important. If Aaron had, an, had a rod that budded and produced ripe almonds, it was not the rod of an oak tree. That's right. It was an almond tree. And the very name Jebel Makla, which is the, the dark black peak we believe to be Mount Sinai, that very name means Almond Mountain. Jebel Laws. Uh, oh, uh, that's, sorry, that's right. Yeah. Uh, I Jebel said Laws. Makla, what I'm talking about is Laws. It means Almond Mountain. Makla, on the other hand, Jebel Makla means the quarry. Uh-huh. And what, uh-huh. what came out of the side of the mountain? Mm-hmm. They quarried the pillars, the pillars out of the side of the mountain. So you have to, yeah, you have to forgive me for I'd, I'd never flipping the two names around there. But a... laws, laws, we actually pronounce it laws. But in Hebrew as well as Arabic, there's a lot of those crossover words that are uh-huh. identical, ras and rosh. Uh-huh. Same, same meaning, head of, mm-hmm. in both Arabic and Hebrew. It's ras in the, in the Arabic and rosh in the Hebrew. Uh, laws, they actually pronounce it lose. And it's also pronounced lose in Hebrew. And it means the nut tree or specifically the almond. So there's Jebel laws, the almond tree. Okay. Okay. And and how specific that is to the golden candlestick. Uh You know, the the seven-tier candlestick of the tabernacle was fashioned after the blossoms and the the knops, as the King James calls it, of the almond tree. Uh So you have all of these elements coming together. The right most here. important thing that you said, though, when I've had learned rabbis in Israel say to me, why Mount Sinai is down in Sinai, I'd say, with all those people that died, where are the bodies? The grave. The graveyard yes, is the thing that really yes. nails I mean, this graves. place down. It is yeah. one of the many, many things about this site. And see, there's so none down there. I'm sorry. Th- no. There's none down no, there. No, there's none down there. In fact, uh, if we we'll go... Let's go to photo 43 through mm-hmm. 47. You can see there in the yellow where we've got it marked. You, you, uh-huh. Do you see how this map is beginning to fill up around these oh, two mountains yes. of various potential um, matches uh-huh. to the biblical record? Okay. Okay. This, what's encompassed in this picture, the outer red ring is a fence that the Saudis have, of course, blocking okay. this area off. But you can see that the landform comes up a bit and there's like a high platform. Uh-huh. This area is larger than the size of a football field. It's enormous. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And we do have, as we were speaking of earlier, a biblical precedent that to mark a grave, Jacob took a stone and stood it up as uh-huh. a pillar which marked the grave of uh-huh. Rachel. Uh-huh. So it was something that they did do in this day and time. Yeah. All of these gravestones are standing out there in this field that uh-huh. the Saudis have marked off. Uh-huh. Yeah. And that's my son. At yeah. that point in time, he's far taller than I am now. But at that point in time, he was about my height, which is about 5'2". So you can see the size of these stones. Mm-hmm. This, and, is, this is the largest stone in the area, but mm-hmm. I, I, I'm not exaggerating when I say... Hundreds to thousands, and not more than that, uh, in this area with multiple, multiple graves and layers of graves. So mm-hmm. it's a very, and another uh, interesting point is that they believe, and I believe this, uh, this came from Glenn, a friend of ours who had done some lightweight wave imagery of the site. He said all the graves went in at one time. How they know that exactly, I'm not sure, but that was the conclusion. Mm. That he well, had it, what he said was it appears that all of this ground was disturbed, disturbed at once. once. In other mm-hmm. words, mm-hmm. first off, it's in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. You don't have enough nomadic population in a thousand years to produce that amount of, sure. of uh, graves. Mm-hmm. But secondarily, the ground appears to have all been disturbed at once. So mm-hmm. what we would be talking about is a mass burial in the middle of nowhere. Why? Mm-hmm. And and it's not, the, the markers there are not in what we have been told, and we lived in Arabia for a long lot of years, they're not, bury, they're not burials that are marked in an Islamic fashion. So our best guess is that this happened sometime long before that mm-hmm. era, mm-hmm. and it all happened at once, and it just happens to be a couple of miles or kilometers probably north out of this area where this congregation would have been if we're correct about the fact that they Mm -hmm. were there in this valley. Mm -hmm. So, I I mean, you know, you're looking at this and then you see quail and almond trees and fig trees and...
And the almond trees, again, the almond tree makes a perfect walking stick. And we found that out because I wanted to get a couple from the trees. And the, the way they come out of the trunk is they come out straight as an arrow for about six feet. So you get these nice mm -hmm. inch and a half branches that are very straight and long. So we were able to cut a, a couple mm -hmm. of these, and we have brought them back to us. Mm -hmm. But this is Dr. Leonard Moeller, who has written the book, The Exodus Case, which we offer on our website as well. But you can see me standing there with him, and we're showing images, and in our hand, this is a slide from our PowerPoint presentation, so you can't see the, the hands. But the hands are full of the almonds. And the note on the bottom says that my birthday, September 24th, 54, but notice his. Same the day. Exact same the same day. day. So we have a man on the other side of the planet and Jim and Penny coming together over this mountain because he had written his book well before he knew who we were, yeah. but he was using our images. Where was he from? Of, and, and he's from Sweden. Sweden. Uh, yep, he's from Sweden. And again, his, he's got a phenomenal work that is called The Exodus Case, and, uh, and that is offered on our website. All right. So I think we ought to go to uh, the rock at Horeb, roll in. Possibly the greatest witness giving validity to Mount Sinai being in Arabia is the rock at Horeb. This enormous rock is split cleanly down the middle and is completely different from anything else in the region. It stands high atop one of the boulder hills that dot the landscape and on the west side of Horeb, not Sinai. The Bible identifies it exactly this way. I'm standing on the back side of the rock here and it's easy to see just how large it really is. As I began my walk between the two giant slabs of rock, I became acutely aware that something entirely miraculous had taken place here long ago. Making my way right through the middle of a split, scriptures started rolling over and over again in my head. They became alive to me as I made it through and sat down on the front side I began to notice immediately the deep channels that were cut into the stone both in front and the back of this rock. You can see one of these channels clearly here. Deep gouges and grooves are apparent at the base also along with a strange erosion pattern from below that is unique to this rock and no others in the valley. With rainfall every 10 years amounting to less than an inch here, these very obvious cuts made by copious water flows were indeed compelling. Again, the channels are obvious. As we followed the course of the water all the way down and into the valley, we realized the immediate area under the rock was of a smooth and unbroken granite, unlike the crushed particles of stone we'd been hiking on all over the rest of the region. If this rock was the one Moses struck, the waters would have cooled up substantially and the whole of Israel, including their flocks, could have taken their fill and been satisfied. In addition, a stone altar lies at the ground base of this rock. The Amalek came to fight Israel there at Rephidim, where the rock was, and after the battle, Moses built an altar and called it Jehovah Nisi. This giant stone has a circular pit we believe was formed by cumulative fires. Clean through this rock at the ground level below, evidence of ash can be seen. Psalm 78, 15 and 16 says, he clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused the waters to run down like rivers. Plainly how large that oh, rock really is. And I tell you what, we found that rock um, the very first time. It was April the 2nd of 1992. We were completely lost. We thought we were going to come up in a valley and climb up over the top of the of the mountain and get down into that area where the pillars and all are mm -hmm. we were completely off base but you know what sometimes you're off base <laughs> by design <laughs> yes <laughs> and what ended up happening we came upon this rock and if you if you'll head for go ahead and put up the map we'll show you exactly where it's located 48 you see in the yellow there, the rock at Horeb. And the uh -huh. reason why I was telling you earlier we believe these two peaks are important is because that rock is never spoken of as the rock at Sinai. It's only ever spoken of as the rock at Horeb. And mm. that is the side, it's on the west side of this other mountain, the, the one properly called Jebel Laws. 
So uh, that's where it's located. And if you go to the next picture, you can see just how it stands out in the landscape. My, my. In fact, I put the uh, we made the cover of my book this mm -hmm. because it's very very specific. Um, you know, in my little Sunday school mind, I guess I had pictured that Moses tapped a little rock and everybody stood in line with their little cup. No. You got to think way bigger than that. They've been three days in the wilderness. You can, that's actually Dr. Leonard Moeller right there in the trip we made in 2003. You can see he's halfway up the rock there. Uh -huh. You see how big it is. Everything that we have found in this landscape is far bigger than we could have ever imagined. But what happened is this is an enormous rock and the miracle that must have taken place there when Moses struck that rock the first time, like Jim has always said, it probably rivals the parting of the Red Sea because the water that would have gushed forth. But you know what? They were three days in the desert. Mm -hmm. They had come out of the area of Mara and Elim and they were three days in the desert, no water, a million plus people, flocks, herds, mm -hmm. children, mm -hmm. you know. If, if it's one little trickle from like the traditional area, you've got people that are going to die before they ever get to the water. That's right. But where this thing broke apart and the waters came up from the great depths, as, as the scripture says, this would have gone and flowed down into the valley area there and it would have pooled up. And because of the rocky terrain there, it would have pooled up greatly. We've got a good picture 51, of that. Yeah. You can see out in front of where the rock is, you can see that that whole area in front of it's been washed clean of, of mm -hmm. the topsoil. It's mm -hmm. a rock basin. And that water by the gallons would have poured down out of there mm -hmm. and it would have pooled up. So the whole nation, you can see how all the rock, it's been Everybody blasted to, drink to bedrock once. right uh -huh. there in front of this rock. Everybody could have drank all at one time. Uh -huh. And um, the very next one, though, this is where it gets profound to us. It's not just a matter of finding a rock that looks good. Scripture says he clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. Clave. Oh, and please help me in my pronunciation of this, because I know your Hebrew scholars, uh, Bill Cloud, will probably <laughs> laugh us right off the sofa here. But um, baka, to split, to divide, to move asunder, uh -huh. according to the, the Strong's that I have found, it says he split the rocks in the wilderness. That's the very same Hebrew word there, baka, that is used in Zechariah where it says, when Messiah's feet shall touch the Mount of Olives, it will cleave asunder. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll go one way mm -hmm. and the other mm -hmm. way. That's the very same ro uh, word that's used for this rock. Wow. So if you find the right rock, it's not a rock with a bunch of little round fissure holes that water mm -hmm. might have come out of. Mm -hmm. It's a rock that's been divided. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's very specific because the very next thing it says, if you'll go back to that same photograph the next thing is it says is that he caused 53. the waters to run down as rivers brought streams out of the rock caused them to run down you have to have an elevated rock to have water run down yes, you do. but the clue here is in corinthians it says the rock that followed them through the desert was christ Yeshua. That's he right. was the one who was there in the desert. And mm -hmm. we have the most magnificent symbol of Isaiah's suffering servant, the smitten one, mm -hmm. the one whose uh, whose life poured right out, out for mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. That's the perfect picture of what we see here wow. in this desert. So it's so much more than just, you know, does this rock look like a rock that water might come have come out of? There's a picture there that we believe is yet waiting for a future people that will stand below it and recognize who that really represents. Oh, amen. Uh, let's go ahead and we're going to do the last of the video roll-ins okay. we have uh, called Ref, Refidim. In the same area that the split rock at Rephidim is found, dozens of ruins dot the landscape, including cairns, kilns, and stone furnaces. These circular formations, however, are by far the most intriguing and seem to be the oldest in the valley. Arranged with several connected together, they even have doorways and thresholds. The Amalek came to fight Israel at Rephidim. I found at least eight sling stones among these circles in evidence of that very battle. The circles are oriented toward this ridge where we saw a brilliant light in April of 1992. Arab lore tells of a mysterious mountain of lights here called Jebel al-Nur. From Rephidim, we travel south to the crossing site of the Red Sea. Here we found an outstanding witness to a catastrophic event. Massive coral heads 
have been ripped from their bases and thrown far upon the shore. In numerous places, bronze pieces are embedded among the coral and the twisted shells. Amazingly, this petrified formation is not found anywhere else along the entire Gulf of Aqaba. And now, to the awesome wilderness of Arabia. South of Mount Sinai, in the most uninhabitable regions of the country, artifacts can be found scattered all over the desert. The arrowheads and spear points found here are known to be of Egyptian design. Their sheer numbers prove that a vast congregation of people passed through this place. Here, you can see the delicate pressure flaked points. Beside the arrowheads, more weaponry, such as hand axes and this bola type, have been found in abundance. Others include handheld grinders. The Bible tells us that the women ground the manna and baked it into cakes. All the way back to Rephidim now, we find petroglyphs or stone carvings on numerous outcroppings of rock. Perhaps the most profound of all are the feet carvings. From small to large in size, they are found all over this region. Awe-inspiring they are, for Moses told the children of Israel in Deuteronomy 11:24, Every place whereupon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. You can see from all those leading up to the footprints, there's there, the evidence just continues to mount and continues to mount. But um, in the very beginning there, you saw that table full of artifacts. Yes. This is from a deep desert down in Saudi Arabia. This isn't from up in the northwest where the mountain is. This is in a deep southern desert of Arabia. And as we began to find these things down there, it dawned on us, what if the, the wandering, actually, the wandering in the wilderness, the 40 years in the wilderness, actually took place on the Arabian Peninsula? Not from northwest Arabia northward, because you run into all sorts of uh, problems there. You could put a line of a million people in northwest Arabia, and it would reach Jerusalem. You can't wander for 40 years with that many people <laughs> in that small of a space. Uh -huh. So we began to look at these things, but I'll come back to that in just a minute. If you can pull up that, uh, which one is it, the 54? through 60. These feet, or these footprints, are actually, we call them the footprints, but to be honest, these are soles of feet. Uh -huh. These are not feet with toes, like mm -hmm. some sort of mm -hmm. prehistoric cave art. There's something very specific going on here, and we've seen these all over Arabia, but they are heavily concentrated up in this area by where this huge split rock is. And I just happened to have my Bible open and reading in Deuteronomy while I just happened to have our, our, uh, our photo albums open one day. And it suddenly occurred to me, I was reading Deuteronomy 11.24. And it occurred to me, what am I looking at here? What if these carved, sandaled footprints that are all over the rocks and these are deeply etched, by the way. Mm -hmm. They would have well standed 3,000 years mm -hmm. of time. Mm -hmm. What if these are the footprints of the children of Israel, according to the promise? Uh -huh. What if? And I, I remember I went screaming down the, uh, down the stairs and told it to Jim, and he just looked at me like I had completely lost my mind, <laughs> which he probably had a right to do. But look at what it says. In Deuteronomy 11.24, every place where on the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. This was a progressive promise given. Oh, it started back with Abraham. Yes, Arise and walk the length and the breadth yes, of the land. Did. Well, we have it on good knowledge living in Saudi Arabia for 12 years. They fully say that Father Ibrahim of the Quran wandered the whole Arabian Peninsula. Now, why would they have that in their own history? We found a book in one of the Islamic bookstores uh, out of Mecca and Medina that one of their caliphs said very clearly that Moses and the children of Israel wandered through Mecca. That's way down on the western wow. Saudi Peninsula. So why is it in their history, but we have no concept of it? Mm -hmm. And we say, no, it can't be. Tradition says mm -hmm. it has to be up mm -hmm. uh, north of uh, the 
tip of the Gulf of Aqaba. All the wandering had to take place there or within the traditional Sinai. So, you know, we're looking at these various things, but the footprints become extremely important. And gosh, I wish I had time. We could teach for 10 hours on just this one subject. But there are etchings next to the footprints. Um, I'm not at liberty to say the names of some of these experts that are working with us on this right now uh -huh. for their safety's sake, to uh -huh. be perfectly Continuing honest. Continuing research. Uh -huh. Continuing research. But the, there is Thamudic characters, and this is highly controversial. This is not a proven thing yet, but it's, it, it's so profound, I'm quite sure it's going to be end up being proven. Sure. But next to these footprints are some etchings that were pointed out to us as being the actual a he, a proto Hebraic character, a Thamudic character, which related to the kaf, or which is in Hebrew the cup of the palm of the hand or the sole of the foot. So if we have a sole of a foot that's been traced on a rock, first off, the time it would take to do that, but you know, if yes. that's your promise, you inherit every place you put the sole of your foot, I can guarantee you I'd be out there etching mm -hmm. myself <laughs> on the rocks. But someone actually took the time to put next to that a Thamudic character that meant the sole of the foot. Uh -huh. So why would you have the sole of the foot plus an alpha character that says the sole of my foot was here, basically? If this does not relate to the children of Israel, um, that is more profound to us than even the possible location of the real Mount Sinai because of that promise, because that brings it to where we are today. Why are all these footprints all over the Arabian Peninsula? And is anyone going to recognize whose feet they really are? Wow. Now, if you have an idea, I've got to tell you just very quickly, we have a very, very dear friend and brother in Christ. His name is Dr. Sung Hak Kim. I can't even begin right now with the time we have to tell you how we were connected with him and, and how it all worked out. But this dear gentleman was with his family, and from 2001 all the way through about 2006, he was in Saudi Arabia. He was the personal physician to one of the princes of Saudi Arabia. And long story short, he found out that this was a potential for the mountain, and the Lord led him and his family the same exact way that he did ours. Dr. Kim also says many times he's take one family from the east, he takes one family from the west to prove who he is. So he, he, is, he is our brother. He's so close to us. He shared something with us, and his discovery, he and his wife found something that is so profound within the vicinity. It was not right at the base of the mountain, but within the vicinity around the mountain that's going to become the greatest discovery uh, of our time, which proves to us who was doing the actual writing on these rocks. This is Dr. Kim. This is his photograph and his discovery. We have a covering over it, but the next photo we're going to show you. If you have any doubt as oh, to who wrote on those rocks, goodness. you don't now. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, can you even imagine? Now, that, uh, that character we were showing next to the footprints is a calf. It's three lines, straight, three straight lines. That calf fits into the ancient Thamudic language, which evolves into the ancient Hebraic. But what is, what is being revealed here, and, and scholars have debated whether it's uh, 1,000 B.C., 3000 BC, but they never get around the time of the Exodus. And what this is going to do is focus people and the scholars to look at the time of the Exodus for the origin of this Thamudic language. And a lot's going to be come out, coming out about the origin of the language and its generation, its, uh, its a conception right there at the mountain, the language being given and, at the mountain. And what you see here is now the oldest known menorah as opposed to the one over the Titus Arch uh -huh. in Rome. Uh -huh. Which is 200 B.C. And Dr. Kim and his wife, Jenny, found it there oh, in awesome. this region. So if you really, you know, there's no doubt in my mind before I ever saw this, who was making the etchings on these rocks uh -huh. and who was making those footprints. But uh -huh. now, what other group of peoples would have etched a menorah on the rocks? No, no, what no. other? I mean, it, it's just as plain as day. One other comment about Dr. Kim is he could speak fluent Arabic which I could not. And he was able to talk to the local Bedouin. 
uh, when he would go out and, and do these uh, these uh, trips to look for petroglyphs and these kind of things. And he said their comment about the Thamudic language was, Yahud was here. Now, Yahud is, is another name for Israel to them, to the, to the local Bedouin. Mm-hmm. So what they were saying was, the people that have put these here are the Israelis. Yahud was here. And all of these inscriptions that you're seeing were generated by them. So we're seeing a picture of the rocks in Arabia. These things cover the, the western portion of Arabia all the way down mm-hmm. into Yemen and on around into the yeah. eastern province. Yeah, so we can go here next. But why is that so important? Well, it's utterly astonishing that in our day and 63. time, something of this magnitude would be related. 63. You know, the world is trying to get Israel to give back most of the land that she currently has. Mm-hmm. And, Absolutely. Um, when the promise is that wherever you place the soles of your feet, God will eventually give you the land, you've got a whole nother concept of just how big Israel might mm-hmm. really be mm-hmm. when you look at this. Mm-hmm. So, th- and, and this is the crux of what it comes down to. Where is the land of the wandering? We have to, by virtue of the fact, what did the Lord say? He said, now turn and go into Next the slide. desert by the way of the Red Sea. Next slide. Yeah, at the top, what we're saying is the uh, scripture where it says, now turn and go into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And we're looking at the location of Midian up in the top left corner of the Arabian Peninsula. And then what we have is an idea that they traveled south into southern Arabia and that the great and terrible, terrible wilderness that we see is actually what they call, the Arabians call the Rub Akali. Now, there's some uh, interesting information coming out about the name places in some of these uh, southern Arabian areas. And the Rub Akali, as pointed out by Dr. Leonard Moeller, also may mean Reuben the Chaldean. So we see in the Great and Terrible Wilderness evidence of the name of Reuben as well as some yeah. other tribe names, the tribe of Gad and Manasseh in that region. It's, it's very interesting research. And, and back in one of those Rollins, you saw all those artifacts and that, that land where it's nothing but sand as far as the eye can see. We are truly there talking about a Great and Terrible Wilderness. And if you don't have water and if you don't have the manna, you die. Mm-hmm. And all of those artifacts are coming out of that deep desert region. So who was it that was down there? Who wandered all the way down there? Why are there such serious and very ancient, not from the time of the Babylonian exile or the overruns of Rome, why are there thousands of years old Jewish settlements in Yemen? They've been there a lot longer than the dispersions. Mm -hmm. So where, where, where did that originate? One of the things that uh, is closely being followed, besides the fact that we've got the evidence of the footprints, this language that's written on these rocks that the menorah uh, testifies to, shall we say, uh, also follows this pathway all the way down the Arabian Peninsula and over into the uh, southeastern areas of Arabia. Why is this language being written on the rocks all the way down? You know what the Lord's command was. He said, I'm giving you this here Mm -hmm. at Sinai. You teach it to your children. You write it on your doorposts. Mm -hmm. You write it. You Mm -hmm. teach them this is the covenant. You teach them these things. And Mm -hmm. this language gets more and more prolific on the rocks the farther south you go. So we have this amazing story of the alphabet going down the peninsula and getting more and more refined as it does and looking more and more like proto-Hebraic. Then this very thing right here, every place where on the soles of the uh, where on the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. Go to the next slide. The next slide. There we go. Look where the footprint go. Oh. There is evidence that the footprints they've been seen. In deep South Arabia, they've been seen in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia. They've been seen up and around the curve of Arabia to the north along the Euphrates. And they've been seen all over the land of Midian. So are we having a picture that's beginning to form here 
of where the wandering in the wilderness really took place, the great and terrible wilderness, let me assure you, we've crisscrossed Saudi Arabia time and time again, and it is a great and terrible wilderness. And you could easily lose a million plus people in this vast continent Mm -hmm. for the length of time the scripture says Mm -hmm. that they will. But this is one of the most profound things ever. And I tell you what, we have to credit Dr. Leonard Moeller for coming up with some things that that are just astonishing. They really are. When we first began to speak with him in early 2000s about, we, Jim and I just are, are determined because of what we've seen, the whole of the Arabian Peninsula is where the wandering in the wilderness took place. Because you see, when you get the mountain in the right place, then everything else opens up to you. Mm-hmm. So we were telling him about these things, and I think he thought we were insane at the beginning. But he is, uh, he is quite... Uh, an extensive research scientist and you know he's not going to go out on a whim just because Jim and I think something might be Mm -hmm. Um, he went home and did a great amount of study he happens to have some very ancient maps uh, particularly one that was in French and let's see which was the number of that um, that slide same slide back up Um, we'll pull that back up here and I'll show you some of the things that he has found um, over in the right-hand side, you'll see people de Gad. That in French is the people of Gad. Why is this ancient French map have the people of Gad locating in what is now current-day Oman? And if you look just a little bit north of that, there's something profound. You'll see a green star that says Asher. Well, guess where that Asher is? That's where we lived in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia, and that's where the major oil fields are. What does the book say? Dip in the toe of Asher. Asher Asher shall dip his foot in oil. It's the blessing of Jacob upon his sons. What is Asher doing? But, of course, in modern-day maps, you don't find any of this. Oh, absolutely And Dr. Moeller is the one who found these. This is where he found what if Rub al Khali in Arabic means the empty quarter. But how closely does this sound to Reuben the Chaldean? Reuben the Calais. Reuben the Calais. What, and, and who took their inheritance in the wilderness? Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Why do we find on an ancient French map Gad and Reuben? Highly possible. But, but the mind blower was this. Down at the tip of the uh, Red Sea down there, you'll see in the bottom mm-hmm. central, Ras Israel. Uh Head of Israel, Uh down there located in what is now uh, Yemen. Why would, who in their right mind in current day would name something Ras Israel? Arabic Ras is the same as Hebrew Rosh, head of, beginning of. What is something called the beginning of Israel or the head of Israel doing all the way down in Yemen? And why don't you find it on any current maps? Something is going on here. History rewritten, huh? Something is going on here. And one of the other things about that map was that uh, all of the red stars that you see, and there were many, are things that in our research we have collected together as possible matches to biblical sites. Mm -hmm. Other people have gone out and said, yes, uh, Uber is in Arabia, um, Gerar, some of these other cities, Mm -hmm. they've identified them. The archaeologists have said they're possible sites. So all of those are marked on there as well. And you can bring that slide back up just one more time. But I wanted to point out that uh, where the blue stars are, you see, are around the mountain. And and Mm -hmm. back when Emmanuel Anadi was put together his identikit, he said, this is what you should find. 28 of those stars are piled up on top of each other as things that we have seen about the mountain in character, artifacts, Mm -hmm. all the other information. 28 of those things piled up together as possible matches to the Bible. We believe very closely in, in that they are our exact matches, but again, we have to leave it for interpretation. So that's an overview of what we think um, this m- moving Mount Sinai into the Arabian Peninsula, what this does and how it explodes this idea of a wandering in the wilderness and a march straight north mm-hmm. from Sinai because they're not captured by the Gulf of Aqaba anymore, forced north, now they're free to go in any direction, north, east, and south. And south is the direction we believe they went into. Where does Raqqa Mecca come into this? It has to play something in there. 
We do a presentation yeah. where we, um, we go from all of these things. There's so much information here. And when we, when we get into this section, that comes up, but I would dare not give it away in this <laughs> <laughs> we have such a short space of time, time right. to get to but, it and, and really develop that idea. really said something about that. But you see yeah. it, yes, yeah. and, and you see that is where, uh, yeah, we have a connection, and you uh, know, real I, close connection. Yeah, and, and our dear friend Avi Lipkin, who and was, that's who was here was with that, you, yes. mm -hmm. Avi, Avi was the one. When, this is why we we had quite a night that night that that we spent. Uh, Avi was staying at our home with us, and uh, we kept explaining to him Jim has some very strong evidence of of just how and where that whole box the, the that Kaaba. whole building the Kaaba the origin has the very very close ties we he do must believe in there this spring because he came here with this in his mind he did he was okay. with us like in March or so and it yeah. was shortly thereafter he was here on this program said we had re-energized his fervor yeah. about this idea because he had this in seminary years ago yeah. when he was studying and he had a thought about it but when we presented our material and I showed him some of the things that we believe it just, mm -hmm. it just it connected really fired to him. him up he believes very strongly and, and I know he shared this with you that the phylacteries which are perfect little black boxes they are a, a perfect copy of of the covered Kaaba. building there, the Kaaba. So there is a very strong connection to the wandering in the wilderness and that very thing. Oh, but man, we're, we're going to have to leave that for another time. Uh -huh. but Off air, we can have yeah. a discussion yeah. <laughs> about When it all comes down, it's all coming to a head. Yes, it is. It is. This is being revealed in this day and age for, for just That's time. exactly <laughs> right. And you know, what this opens up a mass amount of possibilities, and I'm just going to go ahead and throw out a couple of these, because in our hearts and minds, we're sure of it.